in today's Dread episode. Nineteen ninety three was a shock because of one game, Doom, basically reinventing the FPS genre. But many players were still left with Amigas and the power to run such an engine. Many games tried, but in the process had to use tricks, remove features, or reduce screen size. They were fun, but couldn't come close to the original. I am KK of Altera Group, and here's my try to change that. Hello again and welcome back. Let's take a look at Dread again and see what's still missing. Or rather listen to what's still missing because so far we had completely no sound. So let's change it now. To know what sounds we need, let's gather all the silent animations we have right now. The tool already supports animation preview, but I have used it only for the weapons. Object logic and animation is handled directly from the scripts, so let's rewrite it in a form our tool could show. This way we can easily see what animations we have so far, find matching sounds and synchronize them. But first, we have to load them. Sounds are loading now and the tool can show some basic information about them. My crude import can only load basic WAV files, 8 or 16 bit, with one or two channels at any sample rate. Upon load, they are converted to mono 8-bit samples, which the Amiga can play. Now we need some way to play them in the tool. And here for help comes the TinyMod CPP, a fun piece of code written by KB from Farbrausch demo group, which is a one-file implementation of an Amiga mod player for Windows. It contains a nice Amiga sound chip playback emulation, which I'm going to use here as this code was released to public domain. The Paola sound chip emulation here runs at 3.5 MHz and uses high quality downsampling to bring the result back to the usual 4400 Hz. This should allow us to faithfully play back samples as they would play on the real chip. So let's test it. We are getting somewhere, but playing random parts from the tool memory, finished with a crash, was not exactly what I was aiming for. The problem was the loop setting. We need at least one sample for the sound to loop at all. Now we can play the sounds. They came out distorted and very loud, which you don't hear because I reduced the volume a bit while editing this video to save you a headache. This is a hard-coded setting, but still an easy fix. Now we can review the freedom sounds of the shotgun guy. They are played a bit low pass filtered, but remember that we are playing them through the custom Paula emulation. Right now, they are all using a sample rate of 22,050 Hz, which makes them quite large. The chip emulation downsampling uses high quality sync filtering, so after some refactoring, I am using it to change the sample rate of the loaded samples as well. This will allow us to easily play with the playback quality, so we can trade quality for size. Let's try 4000 Hz. And we have another crash, pointing to the Paula emulation code. Looks like Paula emulation was still playing the one sample loop of a sound when I tried to reload them, which made the playback code read an invalid sample again. Let's make it play a dummy sample on all four channels before samples get reloaded. Ok, small typo here. Paula uses signed numbers, so the neutral sample should be a true zero value, not 128, which I used as a middle value between 0 and 255 byte range. Ok, playing is fine now. Reload is working and, except for a few clicks, the downsampled version plays nicely as well. 
Let's start with 8000 Hz. The 4000 Hz version still sounds decent and saves over 5 times the RAM, so let's find out how low we can go. At 2000 Hz the sample starts sounding gritty and gets completely obliterated the lower we go. A decent sound card would still play them normally, but Polar Chip does no sample interpolation and produces much more distortion, kind of going into a chip tune mode. So let's stay at 4000 Hz for an acceptable compromise. <laughs> The other samples also sound quite well enough at that rate. Ok, this one definitely produces a lot of clicks, so a revision of the downsampling algorithm will be in order. As we now can load and resample the sounds, let's get them to play in the game engine. Pistol shot sound would be an obvious first candidate, so let's reload it. In the meantime, I've added the export routine and a new script function, so we can easily invoke a sound function from the script. Compiling and exporting in the tool outputs the data in the export include file with our sample, with added information about the sample length and playback rate, as well as the sample data itself in the Polar Ready format. The compiled script also now features a call to sound playback function which we don't have ready yet. Because programming the Polar is not exactly trivial. As already said, the Polar chip is the one responsible for the sound playback. It still needs to be fed sound data, which is provided by the direct memory transfer circuits of the Agnes chip. After the CPU sets the address, length, frequency, volume and enables the data transfer, both chips cooperate to continuously play a looping buffer from memory. So let's write the minimal playback routine. We are ready to write the playback function with the A0 register pointing to our exported sample structure. Let's load the chipset address to A1. The first word, the sample length, is read into the audio length register of channel 0. The second word, the playback rate, into the PROT register. Let's set the max volume of 64. The rest of our data are just the audio samples, so let's write this address to the location register. And finally, when all is set, write a proper value to enable the DMA transfer of the audio channel 0. All done, return from the function. And if you are still watching this, didn't skip this video and are not bothered by the technical details, you may really consider a mega coding. Will it work? It kind of does. Looping the sound was expected, as this is just how Paula works, but I've got the loop length wrong. Because Paula counts the data size in 16-bit words, not bytes, we had set twice the sample length, which also played some of the random memory. Works now perfectly, but once it started, the loop never stops, nor gets restarted on the next shot. To stop the sound immediately, we can simply disable the data transfer, and Paula will stop when she runs out of data. But to stop after the sound has completed, we have to know exactly when it finished playing the first loop. Unfortunately, Paula triggers the interrupt when she starts playing the buffer, so for the first interrupt we have to do nothing, and stop only when the second one arrives. And my code does exactly that. When sound is triggered, it installs the first interrupt and plays the sound as usual. The first interrupt routine does nothing but install the second one. And the second one disables the interrupt, stops the data transfer and sets sound volume to zero. And it kind of works. Until you start shooting continuously. The sample is slightly longer than reload time, so the sound goes out of sync. 
Unfortunately, we can't stop the song in the middle and play the next one instantly. When we disable the DMA, write new sound address and enable it, not everything goes according to plan. Paula keeps a sample or two internally and will stop only when she runs out of data, so in this case she won't notice interrupted transmission and will not issue DMA reset signal to the EGNOS. EGNOS will keep sending old data and Paula will reset it to the new pointer only when the current sound ends. And that's not the behavior we want. For things to work properly, we have to stop the DMA and wait a few scan lines for the system to come to a complete stop. I definitely don't want to wait a dozen or so scan lines and hurt the performance, so I am setting up two timer interrupt routines. The first one will execute 50 times per second and draw a 3 scan line bar for now, and launch the second timer. The second timer will elapse about 15 scan lines later and call the second interrupt, which will also draw a debug raster bar. All is working perfectly, with the first interrupt almost in sync with the 50Hz video frames and second following soon after. All working completely independently from the rest of the CPU code. I'm ready to move all the sound logic to these two interrupts. In the new Azure driver, all logic is hidden within the two interrupts now. To play a sound, all the logic has to do is to store the sound address and the interrupt handlers will do the rest. 50 times a second, the first interrupt fires and checks if a new sample is pending. If it is, all it does is disable any audio currently playing and leave the rest to the second interrupt. The second interrupt fires soon after, and if a new sample is pending and the audio is already stopped, it starts the new sound. When an audio buffer starts playing, we set the pointer to the zero sample, so the silence is played after the sound plays just once. And this system works indeed. Will it also be able to handle the firing chain gun? Let's try it. I'm adding one playback in the trigger code to make the first sound play as soon as possible after clicking the fire. And another in the firing routine for every bullet beyond the first one. Oh yes, it does work. We are really getting somewhere. Still, I have noticed that our early trigger routine sometimes fires two times. To verify it, I've changed the sound to something with shorter echo and recorded it. It sometimes does play the first sound twice indeed. Some extra protection in the script code making sure the first trigger fires only once solved the problem. The sound triggers perfectly now. So let's load the shotgun sound next. As well as play it when it fires. And while we are at it, let's add the monster sounds as well. Time for some fun. The obvious problem here was that the sounds were cut when the next one was to play. And with a bit of action it happened quite often. But as Paula has four audio channels, we can just quadruple the code in our handler and use each one in turn to see what happens. Hmm. 
Not bad. We are definitely able to handle some action here. Yet you can hear, especially on headphones, that the channels are alternating because sounds are constantly jumping between left and right channels. Let's give Shotgun a test. We definitely still have some audio bugs here. And the Chang'an. Way too much channel jumping now. Try headphones if you don't hear it. Let's change the rules of sound allocation. The first rule, if the same source, a player or an enemy, plays a new sound, it reuses the same channel if able. The second rule, if we have an empty channel, we use it. And the third rule, otherwise, replace the sound that has already played the longest. Let's test the idea. The idea works, so let's add even more sounds. The next sounds to load are the player pain sound, the door sound, and the door stop sound. <sighs> Wait, I remember this one sounding much differently. That's definitely not the sound we loaded despite the done sampling. Something must be still broken in our playback routine. This formula is right, but does it really work this way? A debug print will tell the truth. The compiler didn't like our code, and zero was our new pi. It obviously had to break something in the resampling algorithm. The old way is the best way. Especially when it works. Now the volume is down, so normalize the filter and get the volume back up. And we have perfect emulation of the unfiltered Paola sound. <laughs> this click was annoying. Looks like I missed the clamping in the resampler routine, which fixes it. No click, and now we can talk. Since we have fixed the resampler and the playback, we have to redo our sampler rate experiments. Original sound. 8000 Hz playback rate. 4000 Hz. I can still live with it. 2000 Hz. And this is still too low. Maybe 3000 Hz in the middle. Probably too low. Let's stick to the 4000 Hz. The other sounds are also acceptable. Let's add the player pain sound to the mix. And the door activation sound as well. Test it. Both are clearly working. Some code later. Distance attenuation is the newest addition. The further the sound, the quieter it gets. parameters are still to be tweaked, but we are getting there. Since the four channels are a bit more than we need, we can try adding the stereo mode. Now we have only two virtual channels, but in this mode we can not only play the sound normally, 
must also play exactly the same sound on another channel of the pair. Panning is not implemented yet, but the stereo mode already makes the sound play in the center. Headphones are recommended to hear the effect. Yet, something still sounds off. Let's take a closer look. Our trick of triggering two channels didn't work completely. Because we have triggered the channel separately, there is slight but subtly perceptible delay between right and left channel, which can clearly be seen in the sample capture. So no easy way. We have to completely refactor the code to enable both channels simultaneously. Which of course introduces a new wave of bugs. But at least the bugs are stereo now. Looks like I copied and pasted too much, forgetting we have only one sample header. Should be fixed now. Recording again, to be sure. And we are sample perfect now. To get true stereo, we have to compute the volume of left and right sound channel separately. We can compute the vector from the player to the sound source. Then we cast it onto the vector pointing to the side of the player view using dot product. Comparing the directions and lengths of the both vectors, we can decide how to balance the sound between the left and the right channel. So maybe for you another day just passed without having to use a dot product, but not for me. Let's test what we've got so far. So, stereo is definitely working but adding it also introduced a lot of problems to the audio engine. First, one of the channels starts with zero volume and only catches up later. We also have a varying DC offset. That is, when the sound stops, the audio output should stay at the true zero, at the middle sampler line, but that's not the case here. Also, we have a little click every time a sound stops on its own. Let me cut out the middle of the sample to compare the start and the end of the sound. The waveforms look identical, so we are clearly stopping the sound a bit too late, when it already started looping. To fix this, let's cue the zero sample again. I had this part removed, but looks like we really need it to prevent the looping. And when the sound is being stopped, we also have to set the volume to zero to prevent the DC offset. The delay channel problem was just a typo, not worth showing here. Let's hear this T-Row in action. And this T-Row imager agrees. We've got this right indeed. Let's have this zero as an option. Another thing I've noticed, the Amiga plays the sound a bit differently than the tool. Because the Amiga has a hardware filter that was active by chance. After turning it off, it confirms we have a really good power emulation here. And we've got another option for you to play with.
The remaining sounds we have to load are the rocket launcher firing and the helper effect sounds such as item pickup, weapon pickup, barrel explosion and ammo pickup. And of course we have to trigger them all from the scripts. Let's test it all. I can finally remain silent and let the game play its sound. And that's all for today's video. Thanks for watching. If you want to get notification when the next video is out, please subscribe and click the notification bell to make sure you get one. See you next time.